Well, thank you so much, Dan. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm starting with a warning sli slide for all of you because I was asked by the producers to let you know that I'm sharing some graphic content and images because I think they'll help you better understand the crisis that I'll talk about today. Now, while I'm an anesthesiologist, I'm not planning to put you to sleep today. In fact, I desperately hope that I'm not going to put you to sleep today. I want to awake you, rather, to a crisis that is the absence of anesthesia and ask you to care about five billion in need of safe anesthesia and surgery. Geography truly is destiny. And for the, the populations on this map in yellow and orange, their destiny has been to live without the essential part of healthcare, anesthesia and surgery. I've experienced this crisis in real time throughout my career, and I've been changed by what I've witnessed. I'll never forget a mother that I met in northern Sri Lanka. My experiences with her and her family changed the course of my career. You see, I was serving in northern Sri Lanka as part of a Doctors Without Borders surgical team, serving behind the front lines of the war that had been going on for more than 20 years. Many of you will remember this crisis. The southern Sinhalese army battling the nor northern Tamil separatists, the Tamil Tigers, who were famous for the Black Tigers, the young suicide bombers which terrorized the country throughout the conflict. Those Black Tigers are, are found here in this memorial, which was centered in the town where I lived as part of this team. Living in northern Sri Lanka was austere, and for the civilians that lived here, they lived without electricity, without running water, and without access to health care or basic medicines. But somehow life continued. Babies were born, children went to school, and the Hindu temples continued to offer worship. The hospital where we worked was also in an austere shape. It had been bombed on many circumstances and the concrete walls were crumbling. The roof was merely a piece of tin or in some places a tarp, which blocked out the sun and the rain at times. But it was here that we offered surgery for the civilian population and sometimes for combatants. We offered emergency surgery for landmine injuries and for motorcycle accidents, for infections. And almost on a daily basis, we treated mothers. Pregnant women who had been laboring for days and days would arrive on bicycle, asking for a surgery to take out the baby that was stuck inside. Our operating room was equally in bad condition. The room had an open window with no screen. And through this screen, the dust and flies blew regularly. We had limited access to equipment and to medicines. We frequently ran out of oxygen, out of pain medicine, and out of life-saving medicines. And so on the day that the mother arrived that I mentioned, we were doing our work in the hospital, and she arrived with her physician father, asking us for a cesarean delivery to deliver her second child. Her father spoke English and explained that her first child had been delivered by cesarean section, and therefore he knew that it would be safer for her to deliver in these circumstances again by cesarean delivery. We were able to accommodate her the next day, and so I provided for her a spinal anesthetic that made her numb from about her chest down. And in no time, a beautiful baby, big boy, was born, and we were able to quickly close her incision and move her on to the recovery ward. All was well. But before we left the hospital that evening, we were called back to the recovery ward because the nurses reported that this mother was in distress. It was this room where we went, only by then it was dark, and so there were kerosene lanterns burning in the corners. And I, as I looked across the room, I could see that this mother was sitting bolt upright in bed, and she was leaning forward, clutching her chest. She was surrounded by her family, 
by all the nurses working that evening and by all the patients in the ward as well. As I moved closer, I could see that she was really struggling to breathe. And as I got closer still, I could see that her coloring was gray. I sat down next to her and I felt her pulse. Her pulse was racing. I asked the nurses to bring the few emergency supplies and the oxygen that we had available in the operating room to me. I listened to her lung fields with my stethoscope. And although I had some ideas about what was going on, I had none of the tests or the x-rays that I needed to make a good diagnosis. So we had to move forward with treating her. About the time that the oxygen and the resuscitation bag arrived, she collapsed and stopped breathing. We used the bag and the mask to breathe for her, but her coloring didn't get better. I was feeling her pulse and I could feel that it was getting weaker and weaker. I finally was able to take her blood pressure and her blood pressure was very low. I asked for the life-saving medicine epinephrine that she so needed to help her heart beat better, but I was told by the nurses that we'd run out. And so as we continued standing by eval evaluating her, her heart stopped. We didn't have anything to shock her heart back into action, nor did we have a breathing machine to breathe for her overnight. So we started chest compressions because she was young and healthy, and we hoped that it would restart her heart. And I don't know if we were there for minutes or for an hour, but sometime in that process, her physician father stepped up behind me and he put his hand on my shoulder and he whispered, we have to stop, we have to let her go. I wish I could tell you that this was a rare event, but in the countries I'm telling you about today, it's not only common, but it happens every day because of a lack of access to the things we need, but more importantly, to a generalized lack of access to anesthesia and, and surgery. In fact, five billion people lack access to anesthesia and surgery in the world today. And while this number is extraordinary, I have to tell you that it's based in science. The Lancet Commission on Global Surgery published this report on April, in April of 2015. And this report was life-changing because for, finally we could quantify the problem and therefore we could move forward with the solutions. Now many of you may be asking yourself, how is that even possible? How could two thirds of the world lack access to this ba basic healthcare? Well, I'm here to tell you that the problem started long ago in, in these countries that you see on the map in orange and yellow because they were plagued literally by life-threatening infectious diseases as well as by other humanitarian crises, including droughts, famine, and conflict. And these things combined consumed all the healthcare resources and there was no money or resource for anything more. But somewhere in the middle 90s, these things begin to change. Infectious diseases had better treatment and prevention, including HIV. Some droughts ended, people were fed, and conflicts resolved. And therefore, disease started to look a whole lot more like it looks here in the United States. Trauma became more common, cancer was more common, and heart disease is now everywhere but none of the resources were available to begin treating these problems as they appeared. So imagine with me, if you can, being in a terrible car accident and having a badly, badly broken leg, but no one there to fix it or no one to give you pain medicine for your pain. Or imagine having a heart attack without the critical resources to save your life or to have a cancer that hasn't been diagnosed and you've had it for so long that you now have tumors in both breasts and throughout your body, like this woman who we met and she died only three months later. Or this gentleman who years ago had two very, very small hernias, 
which would have been fixed in a matter of minutes by a quick surgery, but he had no access to that. And so his hernias grew larger and larger, and his pain and immobility increased until finally he could no longer work or provide for his family. In fact, the backlog on surgeries is so big that 143 million cases are needed every year just to begin to catch up. And tragedy further is that 16 million deaths occur every year because of the lack of access to safe anesthesia and surgery, and most of these are preventable. I hope I've made you come to the realization that anesthesiology is central to the solution for this problem. And in fact, anesthesiology is essential to healthcare and integral to health. Living without anesthesiology is painful and life-threatening. And so how does that look on the ground in those countries that I showed you in orange and yellow? Well, I'll give you three examples. In Ethiopia, there are 22 anesthesiologists for 90 million people. In Rwanda, there are 13 anesthesiologists for 11 million. And Sierra Leone has only one remaining anesthesiologist for 6 million people. Well, how many anesthesiologists do you need? How many do we have here in the US? Well, I can tell you that we have approximately one anesthesiologist for every 10,000 people in the US, which amounts to about 60,000 anesthesiologists in all. That's more in this country than for all 80 countries that I showed you on the map. And so let's talk about the solutions because there's so much good news here for us now. Five integrated solutions exist, which will lead to the scaling up of safe anesthesia and surgery and provide for these diseases I've described to you. Data collection and analysis is much needed to ensure we know where the problems are and what is specifically needed. Education and training has to happen for the many doctors, nurses, and technicians that we need to improve access and to improve patient safety. Innovation for new equipment that is cost effective and technology appropriate and is so needed in all these operating rooms around the world. And permanent access to medicines that are in chronic need in many of these countries, oxygen, antibiotics, pain medicines, and life-saving life medicines as well. And the most important solution is that of government. Government has to invest in this process and sustain it, or these solutions will not amount to a permanent fix. And this may be the most difficult part of the solution grouping, because as you might have guessed, this is going to be expensive. In fact, the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery estimates that it will cost $350 billion to scale up to safe anesthesia and surgery. But more important is that it will cost $12 trillion in lost GDP if we don't do this today. I hope you'll agree with me that this has to happen. These important events have already occurred, making this feasible, and we're well on our way to the scale up. I believe that we are well on our way to more anesthesia, more surgery, and to many lives saved. My colleagues and I are working with our partners on the ground to help them make sure that this is a reality. We continue with advocacy. We continue to engage new partners in pharmaceutical companies and medical industry. And we encourage others already on the ground to take up this effort. This is the global surgery era. I continue to experience this crisis in real time and I'm impressed by the changes that I'm seeing. I'm inspired by my partners on the ground, like Dr. Jean, who was the last remaining anesthesiologist in Rwanda. She's still there today, teaching and educating, providing advocacy for patient safety and for anesthesia around the country. And it's because of her and many like her that I continue to work for the five billion in need of safe anesthesia.
Thank you very much.